Well, thank you, Patrick. Thanks for joining the show. Um, I like to do the intro before, so I really just want sure. to jump into it. But um, yeah. the origin of, how do you say it? Budioko breathing? Buteko. Buteko. Okay, I've been yes. saying it wrong for so long. That's um, all right. I definitely didn't read the enunciation. But where did this come from? I know it was a German um, a German researcher. Focused well, on- he, was, he, was a, he was a Ukrainian medical doctor. Mm-hmm. And he noticed in, when he was doing part of his research, he was about six years into his studies. And he noticed the connection between people who breathe hard and their sickness. So the sicker people became, the harder they breathed. So he wondered, was it their sickness which was causing them to breathe harder? Yeah. Or was it their harder breathing which was feeding into the sickness? So he he started experimenting with himself by really slowing down his breath. And he was finding that he was making quite good improvements to his health. So he started then putting the research together. And, you know, even at the time there, like information such as the Bohr effect has been around since 1904. And the Bohr effect simply states that if you breathe hard, you lose carbon dioxide and blood pH increases Mm -hmm. and the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen increases. In other words, the red blood cells don't release oxygen so readily when you're breathing hard. So it kind of flies in the face of everything that's been often discussed in the Western world. People talk yes. about taking big breaths, filling your lungs full of air, taking a big breath in and getting as rid of as much stale air as possible. You hear this all the time. Yeah. And that's it's not a, how it works. No, it's a very, it's a very strange thing. So um, I've I read the book. I heard a lot of what you talked about. And I know that you actually study with Ray Pete. I love Ray Pete. Um, I've uh, dove into a lot of his science, read through a lot of his articles. Yes. And I think it's something so counterintuitive to what most people actually think. Yeah, like, I, I didn't study with Ray Peep, but I remember he was in Portland in Oregon. I think he's from there. Yeah. And I attended a talk there. So he was giving, he was giving a conference. Um, but he's a phenomenal researcher on the basis of carbon dioxide, you know? Yeah. And even just last year, there was a paper that came out looking at rats. So the, the study involved damaging the tibialis muscle in rats. Mm-hmm. And then divided the rats into two groups, rats which were gave CO2 or carbon dioxide transcutaneously mm-hmm. and rats which weren't. And then the rats were sacrificed. The rats which were administered CO2 transcutaneously, their tissue injury repair, their tissue injury had repaired and the other rats didn't. And like that's phenomenal stuff. And that's something like Ray Peets has been discussing yeah. along those lines for, for decades. You know, and it's not necessary to to put a patch to administer transcutaneous CO2 because Mm -hmm. if you hold your breath, carbon dioxide will increase in the blood, but it will also Mm -hmm. increase inside in the cell. Um, So it increases in the muscle. Uh, You know, on the basis of that, then researchers were wondering, at another paper, like, what's happening here? Well, it's quite simple. As CO2 is increasing, blood pH is dropping, and more oxygen is getting to to that part of the body. Yeah. I've even read some... uh studies about uh with ed um it being linked to co2 the lack thereof versus nitric oxide which uh, a lot of times i think people attribute like oh i'm going to take something that's going to increase no and then i'm going to have no ed anymore but okay and i'm not familiar with with uh with ed so i can't give you <laughs> you know like there's there's you know different conditions that that are related to hyperventilation mm-hmm. um we see panic attack people, people with panic attacks. However, even in the group of people with panic attacks, there's maybe two or more subsets. Mm-hmm. So some people we can really notice, you know, they have an aversion to air hunger. They feel suffocated. They feel they're not getting enough air. And another group doesn't. So, you know, within the conditions itself, sometimes it's uh, like I've seen people with epilepsy make great progress. But I can't say that all people with epilepsy are prone to chronic hyperventilation and that we would make progress with them 100%. Panic attacks, we've seen great people make great progress. But again, we can't say that it's going to be 100% just in case there's two or more subsets there. But like, I would say to people, if they're asking, should I practice the Buteco method? I would say, absolutely. 
because it's going to help your sleep anyway. Mm -hmm. It will help you to be calmer and more focused. And it's just a physiological way of breathing to open up your blood vessels, open up your airways and get more oxygen delivered to your cells. Yeah. So it makes total sense and no side effects when practiced properly. Exactly. It's one of those things that like, whether you do or you don't, you're not going to have a bad side effect if you try it. Yes. So why not try? I mean, it's breathing and we yeah. everybody breathes. It's just a different yes. methodology. Totally. It is. And, and the other thing is like for people to experience it, because what we, we are saying is contrary to what people have been taught for years. And um, we're saying breathing light is actually good. You know, if you really mm -hmm. slow down your breathing and gently soften the breath that you're on the verge of air hunger, even though you're feeling, well, it's quite a little bit uncomfortable. It shouldn't be stressful, but if it's a little bit uncomfortable, but still in all, that's the best thing that you can be doing. And the nose itself, the nose is the primary, you know, mode, physiological, normal mode for the mm -hmm. human being is to breathe in and out through the nose. Yeah, I love the, uh, the chapter name, Breathing is for the Nose, Eating is for the Mouth. Yes. Um, but because, I mean, uh, don't most animals, they, yes. they all breathe through the nose, but a lot of them don't have connected um, nasal passages. Airways. And, yeah, yeah, airways. And from, I thought from that was the mouth into the lungs, that their airway is going directly from the back of the nose straight into the lungs. And there's a few exceptions to that. And farm animals, you know, they're inevitable nasal breeders. But if a farm animal is very sick, mm -hmm. it will push its head forward and it will actually start breathing through the mouth. And even a bird, if a bird is quite sick as well, if they're not well, they'll actually start mouth breathing too. Really? So that's what nature is telling us, you know, animals mm -hmm. who are sick mouth breed. But yet mm -hmm. our ancestors all nasal breed. But if we look at the modern world, we know that 50% of studied children are going around with their mouths open. And very few people are telling them otherwise. That's yeah. the problem. Yeah. It's, um, I know there was a study and you link, you don't know, chicken or egg type situation, but processed yes. food to nasal breathing or to mouth breathing. And there was a study showing that cats over generations had that um, narrowing of the face. What, is that a similar methodology? Because that was based on processed foods over time. Yeah, so Pottinger's Cats, now it's a long time since I read that book. Uh, that's the Weston Price Foundation. Um, his other book, Weston Price's, was Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. And they noticed that first generation children, when they switched from a traditional diet over to a processed diet, that they, in some instances, they were becoming mouth breeders. Now, nar narrow jaws are a typical symptom of breathing through the mouth. And again, there's another chicken or egg here as well mm -hmm. is it that the child is born with narrow jaws and as a result they can't get the there's not enough room for the tongue of the roof of the mouth um, and their airways are too small so they have to breathe through the mouth or is it that the mouth breathing has dropped the position of the tongue from the roof of the mouth and as a result the pressure is exerted by the cheeks are pushing the jaws inwards and back so what's causing what but it doesn't matter because you can do something about it we have to recognize if any child is breathing through the mouth, it's not normal. And if any child has narrow jaws, the younger you can, you can get them to wear simple orthodontic appliances. Alpha appliance is a really, really brilliant one. Uh, rapid maxillary expansion. You know, you can just various things that a parent can do to ensure that the development of the jaws is as it should be. Because... If you have an issue, if a child is breathing through their mouth during critical growth periods, mm -hmm. any abnormalities that happen to that face, that's going to stay for lifelong unless something is done to fix it. So mm -hmm. the window of opportunity is pretty brief. And, you know, I think it's, I think the whole orthodontic world as well, especially with traditional orthodontics, you know, is it right for a child to wait until they're 12 years of age before embarking on orthodontic treatment? Um, when most of the growth of the face is taking place, should it not take, should orthodontics not start at three or four years of age when the child is developing? And with that, because it's not just about straightening teeth, but it's looking at the face as a whole as well. Yeah, I went to a, um, a cranial orthodontist. Uh, yes. And their whole thing was like, we want to work with the bone structure of your face. Yes. Unfortunately, the orthodontist that I went to um, when I was a kid, of course, messed things up, helped create an underbite. And so yeah. I've been 
kind of correcting that through tongue position. And I realized I was a nasal breather. I mean, a mouth breather in college, my hands and feet were always cold and I could yes. never figure it out. Yeah. And yeah. then of course it took someone making fun of me over and over again to fix that at the beginning. But once I did, I was like, well, there's this weird correlation between actually breathing properly and yes. being warm. Yeah, of course. Um, cold hands is a very common symptom of mouth breathing. But also waking up tired. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a student going through university. If they're going around with their mouth open and they're, they're sleeping with their mouth open, they're not going to have the same focus. So for them to get their grades, they have to work quite a bit harder. And if there was just a simple, that simple habit was addressed. But it, and that, that habit doesn't address itself unless somebody is either trained or taught or encouraged. Like I, for example, my story, I, give, I had an operation on my nose in 1994. Mm -hmm. And the surgery was a success, but I was never told to breathe through my nose. So from 1994 to 1997, I continued mouth breathing and sleeping mm -hmm. with my mouth open. So the surgery brought no benefits because I wasn't using it. And people said, well, sure, surely it must make some common sense. You know, you had surgery to open up your nose. And why didn't you use it? Well, the fact was that I was 20 years with my mouth open. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be a rehabilitation there to help people switch from mouth to nose breathing because even when the, the physical obstruction is removed and the nose is decongested and the nose is opened up, it doesn't automatically restore nose breathing in the vast majority of cases. So surgery in, is only going to be a success if the individual switches to nose breathing. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, if you're breathing through your nose all the time, will you need a surgery? Because the nose is very good at fixing itself once you use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I, uh, I talk about a lot on heightened living is these different higher leverage skills and breathing, learning to breathe, um, before going and getting fit before doing anything like that. I like to address that as one of the top things because you can think better, you can perform better and you can basically do everything in life better because you're breathing properly. Yes. Um, it's a mental switch. But it's one that's so important to, to switch on because yeah. if not, yeah. everything is affected by it forever. Yes, for sure. I would totally agree with you. Yeah. Um, in sports performance, we look at, you know, really what you can do to improve sports performance. Addressing breathing pattern disorders is one thing. You need good functional breathing during sports. It stabilizes the spine. It helps reduce the risk of injury. It helps improve arterial oxygen uptake. It helps improve oxygen delivery to the cells. Uh, it reduces breathlessness. It improves anaerobic threshold. And those are just simple stuff by addressing breathing pattern disorders. And then if we go one step further and we go into simulation of altitude training, we can improve aerobic capacity, not with everybody. There's some non-responders. Um, but we can certainly increase anaerobic capacity. Mm -hmm. And there's been quite a few studies now, especially coming out of Europe, that breath holding on the exhalation is what we do. It's called hypoxic, which is low oxygen, hypercapnic, which is high CO2. And um, it causes the body to make adaptations, including increased buffering capacity inside in the muscle. So this delays lactic acid and fatigue. So any sports which are involving really high intensity training, um, that require an athlete even to sim stimulate anaerobic glycolysis, mm -hmm. you know, running without air pretty much during training. We can do that with simple breath hold exercises. And we, we can disturb the blood acid based balance to force the body to make adaptation. So during competition, the body then is prepared. Simple things, you know, yeah. and no cost. Like the only cost that we would have is we would encourage people maybe is to get a pulse oximeter. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I'm working with athletes, we use a little pulse oximetry. Yeah. So we have a little device that they put on their finger and it, it emits a red light or an infrared light and it tells you how fully loaded your hemoglobin is, is with oxygen. So we use the exercises to simulate an altitude of about four, four to 5,000 meters. Um, yeah. And it's tough. And that's how you, you make training improvements. Like even at an elite level, where the margins of it of performance are so tight, um, breath holding and changing breathing patterns can be just one of those things to give you, you know, enough of a margin mm -hmm. to, to often make maybe to make a difference between success and failure. 
Yeah, I mean they're running on literally point zero one seconds and, and yeah, time like so that. half a percent is the difference in in, per, in performance between these guys, which is awesome. Um, so I actually for a while I was doing uh, uh, bag breathing as a way to increase carbon dioxide, which is yes. kind of like one of those. It's a double bang, but also not necessarily doesn't mean you're training the nostrils, but. I yeah. definitely saw benefits in, in heating up and being able to fall asleep quicker. And now I'm using the nasal unblocking um, every time before I go to sleep, once I wake up. And especially right now, it's allergy season here. And I'm feeling the allergies, but any congestion, if I wake up with, it goes away like immediately. It's, uh, do, do you wear tape on your mouth at night? Do you wear tape across your lips? Um, on and off. I have before and then i had the wrong tape one time and i didn't like that um but i have and i do like it a lot i'm trying to consciously keep my mouth shut yes yeah yeah because that alone will make there's there's a new tape it's lip seal tape coming from colorado and um, you'll get it on the website lipsealtape.com so it's specifically made for placing across the lips and what i would do with you because it, you know even if somebody has been mouth breathing for quite a while, I think it's important to wear the tape across the lips during the day for different periods, because what you want to do is establish neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. And this is that there's new neural pathways that you're almost that you're changing the behavior of the body to switch from mouth to nose breathing. Wearing the tape, if you were at home, you're on a computer, you're watching TV, you're just walking about your house, the tape will help to reinforce the pattern. And wearing the tape at night is really good because it probably also is going to act in neuroplasticity. Your nose won't fully block if you wear the tape. Your nose will only fully block when you switch to, to mouth breathing. Okay. Yeah, because definitely it's something I've seen um, or something that I've in hindsight realized when I was a kid when my nose would get stuffed up, like holding my breath would let it release pretty easy. Wow, that's cool um and so of course i would try to do that but okay i'm definitely gonna look into that tape because that sounds like a way better solution than just using some sort of tape that i have in my house no it's, you need to get it purpose because it has, it has to be for the tape as well it has to be for the skin like this the ones that we use this is this it's the lip seal tape mm -hmm. um so it's it's very it's i don't know you can't really see oh it there, cool. yeah yeah it's Oh, that's perfect. Um, it's, it's, it's cloth woven. Um, but yeah, no, it works pretty good. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so I did want to dive in a little more into CO2 and how it really works to like relax the, uh, the veins and like really help you with a lot of the processes that most people think they're getting from that big deep breath. Yeah, you know, a deep breath, like if you were to look at what is a deep breath, but a deep breath just means that you're using your diaphragm. Mm -hmm. um, so your diaphragm is your main breathing muscle. Now, your nose is directly linked to the diaphragm. So if you breathe through your nose, you're going to naturally take a deep breath. Oh. Conversely, your mouth is directly linked to the accessory muscles. So the muscles, the upper chest muscles, you're talking about the scalenes, the sternocloid, the mastoid muscles, that's linked to mouth breathing. So when you really think about you know, the shape of the lungs, the lower lobes of the lungs, so the lower part of the lung has got a greater concentration of blood because literally because we're upright. So with gravity, blood is going to go to the base of the lung. If you breathe through your nose, you carry the air deep into the lung because you're activating the diaphragm. And also as you breathe through your nose, you pick up nitric oxide. Mm. And nitric oxide is going to redistribute the, the blood from the lower base of the lung to the upper. So you get a better ventilation perfusion taking place. So deep breathing is correct. But how people think of deep breathing is totally mm. correct. A deep breath isn't a big breath. A deep breath just means you're using your diaphragm. If you're breathing through your nose, you're on the path towards deep breathing because you're using your diaphragm. Yeah. And the other thing is, like, there's no benefit to taking a big breath. If, if I was to measure somebody's blood oxygen saturation, they will be all, already almost fully loaded. And mm -hmm. if they start breathing hard, it's not going to increase this. Um, can, and what, instead, what happens is that the hard breathing is going to get rid of carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is not just a waste gas because in order for oxygen transfer to take place from the blood to the cells, you need carbon dioxide. 
You also spoke about carbon dioxide having an effect on the blood vessels. Mm -hmm. We have 100,000 miles of blood vessels throughout the body. They are influenced, whether they're open or closing is determined by, you know, it's going to be influenced by carbon dioxide levels. Yeah. And all it takes is 30 seconds of hard breathing to, rem to half the amount of CO2 in the blood. And that's why people feel lightheaded. You know, if I told you, Austin, take huge big breaths in and out, in and out, in and out over 30 seconds, you'll feel lightheaded. That's not a sign of more oxygen getting to the brain. That's the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's the... the and you know, off. it's unfortunate. Like we see it in different modalities and it's often trained. We have breathing therapists. You know, you, you hear of breathing therapists are encouraging their clients to take big breaths. It's entirely the wrong thing to do. Yeah. If, if your goal is health and if your goal is to get more oxygen delivered to the cells, we should be slowing down the breath to the point of air hunger and changing our breathing volume, normalizing it. Totally. Yeah. I studied Hatha yoga for a bit and they, um, in the traditional Hatha, they definitely want the diaphragmic breathing, yes. diaphragmatic, but they do like you to move up the whole body. So they're going for a bit more fill. There's a lot of pausing. Um, but I did notice in something like the Wim Hof breathing or some hyperventilating breathing that yeah. um, I quickly stopped doing it because I would get cold almost immediately after. Yeah. And I just knew that it wasn't right to feel one lightheaded, but too tingly yeah. based on the fact that, that, that is absence of oxygen. Yes. Like it will depend on people's baseline. Mm -hmm. So if you have say somebody who's been mouth breathing for quite a while, their baseline breathing is probably not all that good. So it doesn't take much to push them into symptoms. So I think if one is practicing the Wim Hof method, I think like we use a control pause measurement or we call it bolt score and the oxygen mm -hmm. advantage that you must have a minimum bolt score of 25 seconds before embarking on the Wim Hof method because then you've got some resilience oh. and you can cope with it. But if you have somebody with a, with a bolt score of 15 seconds and they start hyperventilating, I think it's going to have too much of an impact on the individual. Yeah. So my bolt score when I started was about 13 seconds. Um, yeah. It's up to about 21. So that makes sense that it's not, um, not a good time to do it. Yeah. I also, so I take cold showers, um, but I like to do more of the nasal unblocking. Yes. Because for me, and the, my thinking behind this is like you can hyperventilate and essentially get your body not to feel the cold. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with feeling the cold, but I noticed with that last breath and then holding the nose, I'm warming up already going into the cold shower. So yes, for me, it's yes. an easier transition. Yeah, I almost yeah. feel it as a better way to do the cold shower. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but there's so much. Uh, so you're massive into meditation. I, I was reading you do 10 days of silence sometimes. Um, the... I do. It's, it's called Vipassana courses. Okay. And they're, you know, the, the ones that I would have attended are organized now. He's since passed on SN Goenka. Um, it's absolutely wonderful thing to do. I've done a few of them. And it's, it's really, you know, it's noble silence. So you're waking up quite early in the morning. Mm -hmm. You're meditating pretty much throughout the day. You go to sleep at night. You wake up, back up again. So there's no communication. You know, there's no, no um, even visual, no written, no voice. And it's seldom that we have that opportunity in the Western world, you know. Like even the fact of having no money in your pocket can be nice. Having no wallet, having no phone no laptop, no, no car keys. Yeah. Um, and it's really getting back to basics. And yeah, maybe people might find that, that a 10 day meditation might be a little bit off putting, but what I'd say to them is anytime you follow your breath, you're taking your attention out of the mind onto your breathing. So make it your focus to follow the breath. And then you're holding your attention exclusively on something for a period of time without distraction. Yeah. That's going to improve concentration, but also, when you focus on your breathing is to gently slow down the breath. And by doing that, it can activate the body's relaxation response. So I think you can get a lot out of it by slowing down the breath. And it's not really so much 
how much time you spend in one sitting, mm -hmm. but it's how often are you aware of your breath throughout the day? And not just thinking about it, but just literally merging with it, getting your attention out of the head and, you know, bringing your attention inwards as opposed to having your attention outwards all the time. Yeah. I love that section in the book about um, the mindfulness and about how like, uh, exactly what you were saying being without a phone i know so many people like break their phone because everyone breaks the phones nowadays and they don't have it through for three to five days and they're like this is the most peaceful it's been in so long and it's like yes of course like if you yeah. just realize that you got to go with go without it for a couple days and yeah. it's not going to change your life in a bad way yeah. again just yeah. like breathing we're changing your breath and making it something better learning to go without something because a lot of times people try to add too much. It's such mm -hmm. an easy way to yeah, get back to the sure. base. Yeah. I just heard this news report yesterday, Ireland, um, the average person in Ireland, according to one study, they access their phone 57 times throughout a day looking at the phone. And I think the, the national or the European average was something around 41 times. Like the phone is a total distraction. Yeah. And all it's doing is training the brain to be distracted. The brain exactly. then is becoming more active. There's more thoughts going through the brain. You've less control over your mind. And as a result, the more we think, the more stressed we are, the more it reduces productivity. You know, if you've got thoughts running and running and running and running and running through your head all the time, and you've no control or way of switching them off, you yeah. don't have control of your mind. Your oh, yeah. mind is in control of you. And the phone is contributing to that. And also happiness, you know, Matthew Gillingworth, um, he, he tracked people, quite a large number of people. I think it was about 5,000 people. And he asked them a question. It was by a, an app called trackyourhappiness.org. He asked them, are you thinking about something other than what you're doing at this moment? And people feed back the results. And he was able to find out that the human being, their mind wanders a lot, unlike mm -hmm. animals. Like animals are very much in the present moment, unless they've been highly stressed. And most of their stress is caused by humans anyway. Yeah. But unlike animals, you know, the human being, their minds are very, very active. And he found that the people who were thinking the most were least happy. So as your thinking activity increases, your happiness decreases. Mm. So people with more anxiety, more stress, more depression, you know, the problem is they can't stop thinking. Yeah. So how, where do we start? Well, gently focus on your breathing. Seriously. Yeah. I mean, I've read that uh, high performers are the people who think the, uh, the least amount as well, because it's something like 50,000 thoughts a day, yes. 60 to 70% are normally negative. So then we're seeking that positive reinforcement from something like a cell phone. And yes. the cell phone, I like to put a purpose to my phone uh, when I'm doing things. So more of like, okay, this is, I'm doing this for business, boom, done. Yeah. And I think we need to return back. I love journaling, like physically writing. Yes. I think returning to that, returning to gratitude and just like an internalizing the self practice is yeah. like one yeah. of the most important things that any human could do. Yes. Yes. I totally agree with you. Um, have you studied any Alan Watts or anyone like that? Or uh, No, I haven't. I've came across Alan Watts' um, stuff a couple of times. I really like Eckhart Tolle. Yeah. Um, like he he was tremendous, you know, and always was. Krishna Murthy is really good. Um, I actually Osho stuff is pretty good. I know he's a little bit controversial, but his stuff is pretty good. And there's other there's other, you know, other people who were in that space, and they're all saying very similar things. You mm -hmm. know, there's not. It's not that just one person has the authority and spirituality. Yeah. Like spirituality is the degree to which you're out of your head and you're living life as opposed to being stuck in your head all the time. And the average Western person, we are literally stuck in our head on a continuous basis. And that's what we want to, we want to avoid. Yeah. It's uh, it's funny. It's like the Zen master people are like, how do I achieve Zen? How do I achieve Zen? And it's like, just be. Yes, what? exactly. Yes. You can't do. Yeah, yeah, I've heard a lot of times people say, we're not human doings, we're human beings. But yeah, yeah. That's very simple. So uh, yeah. It's super simple concept. And it's like, breathe. That's the first and easiest rhythm because rhythmic things are what keeps the world afloat. Yes. To follow. That's why chanting yeah. and all that. Yeah. Um, so I did want to ask you, 
with uh, with heightened living, there's something called higher leverage skills that I like to focus on, bring about. Be- breathing is one of the higher leverage skills that I talk about. But is there sure. anything else that really helped you identify patterns or can be learning to learn something along the lines of a skill that you can see paralleled in so many different fields that really helps you tie connections and, you know, get to where you are? Um, I only made two changes back 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Like when I was going through high school and into university and I pushed myself through a degree I started in the corporate world. I was highly stressed. I absolutely hated my job. And I felt intuitively that I wanted to get a job that I really loved. Mm -hmm. So it was by accident I came across what I'm doing. I started focusing on the breath. I started changing my breathing. I started getting a huge interest just personally in meditation. And those things pretty much led me to where you know where my work took me my work has been very helpful and um, it's been very enjoyable it has been no stress it's been very productive and we've had a huge reach and the see i so i you know it's more of a general skill set mm-hmm. in terms of i think when you're when you're in your corporate life and the big companies I really wonder, you know, what do they think of their employees? I don't think they think much of them. Their employees are numbers. They don't care, you know, and you can be fired just as if you're not, you know, meeting the expectations of the corporate. And this is putting a lot of stress on people. Mm -hmm. Really, we have to be looking at what is it that you can be doing that you absolutely love to do. And it was funny, but the breath, following the breath, it will open up intuition. It will open up creativity. It will make you open to maybe, you know, maybe you're just more aware of what's going on around you as opposed to being stuck in your head. And life directs you. Yeah. And life has directed me tremendously. And of course, yeah, it's just always a few ups and downs. That's normal. But, oh, but overall, um, it's been really tremendous. And the other thing is, like I'm 44, 40, I'm 40, 45 years of age. Most, many people my age now are having burnout. And then they reach 60 or they reach 55. The company doesn't want them because they can get a 25-year-old in to do the job at a fraction of the cost or, you know, at a yeah. reduced rate. So the 55-year-old is expendable. You know, they've, they've put in 30 years of work um, and now they're still a young person and the company doesn't want them because they can get cheaper labor. Well, it's, I think it's really important that, you know, we, we try and, we're self-reliant we're self-independent mm-hmm. and that we're not and i know it's not everybody can work for themselves but to find out some means that you can be self-fulfilled and that you can enjoy your work and also that you have some security in your work in terms mm-hmm. of you're not just in the whim of some organization and um, i don't buy into the big companies to be honest with you i think yeah. it's you know, they, they talk it and they say we've opened door policies. They don't care. You know, mm-hmm. I've seen it before it's the couple of years that I was in it and it, it, it was very stressful. It wasn't a nice place to be. And the best thing that I ever did was to, to, to be able to get out of it. But it was only focusing on the breath. I think if I didn't embark on addressing my own health and also adopting meditation and focusing on the breathing, mm-hmm. I think I would be stuck there. You know, totally. unhappily, unhappily. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I think it, as weird as it is, a lot of times the corporate environment is the exact place that people find what they need to change about the world. Yes. Um, but I agree a hundred percent. These, these companies are literally groom. They groom people from college to be cogs. And then yes. if anything happens, like job security is the biggest fallacy that anybody's ever made up. Yes. Totally. Like, oh, I'll just stay here forever because it's good yeah. and it's comfortable. And then one day yeah. they're like, yeah, we're cutting this position because a robot can do Yes. Yeah, yeah. And that's what's going to happen. Um, like artificial intelligence is pretty much on our doorstep. It's not perfect. You know, I was reading, mm-hmm. there, was a, there was a newspaper article that came out there last week and the amount of carrots that are sold in the UK in supermarkets have gone up through the roof. Well, basically what happens is that people are coming up to the self-scanning um, checkouts mm-hmm. And they're coming up with avocados and expensive vegetables. 
but they realized the carrots are the cheapest vegetables. So they put the avocado on the scale and they hit carrot and off they go with cheap avocados. <laughs> and they've kind of noticed this. So you know there's going to be holes and plenty of holes in yeah. this. You know, there's nothing like the human. The, the human interaction is very important. We, you know, we can't just be replacing everything with a machine. No. Where's it going to go? And what way is the income going to be distributed? Yeah. Um, and, you know, like I'm sure there will be new jobs, babysitting, doing these new machines and all that. But where will the income go? Will the income, the income that's being generated, will it be concentrated in the hands of a very, very small amount of yeah. individuals? Um, you know, and it's not, it's not something to be really worried about, but I think it's something that we should be watching out for. Yeah, totally. I think, um, I think a lot of positions, it's going to change more for doing what you love um, in yes. a lot of ways because, I mean, these monotonous jobs, no one really puts that much effort into. And yeah. like uh, a huge push that I have is um, pushing always for quality over quantity. Yes. No matter yes. what that is. Um, and I have a theory. And it's just a theory. And we'll see if it comes true. But the more that you can push everybody towards quality, the more yes. that they'll do quality in their work, the more that the products that go out in the marketplace are quality, yes. the more that the quality of life is increasing. So it's like yes. one of those, maybe you don't need as much stuff, as much money, as much whatever, because you have enough. Yes. Yes. And then yes. from there, everything expands. And of course, like people like to do everything. There's people who want to do whatever, yes. maybe waste management to like figuring out how ladders work and creating a better ladder. So yeah, I think we'll see some amazing things. So as, we still have the ability to like navigate freely upon the economic ladder. And everything yes. Like yes. That. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I it'll agree. Be, it'll be a, a very, very interesting world and robots are freely floating around. Mm -hmm. um, I did want to ask you if right now you're questioning anything. So um, I like to question just about everything. And that means don't take any information that you hear from one source or from someone who ever attributes their source as they for mm -hmm. granted um, mm -hmm. and instead finding multiple sources and then figuring out your own truth. Is there anything that you're right now really questioning? Not, not that comes to mind. You know, I, it, with my own work and I suppose everybody has a risk that when you're talking about something that there's always a risk that you cherry pick the research to suit. Mm -hmm. and that's something that, is always in the back of my mind that I have to be conscious of that I'm looking at well, where is the weight of evidence and mm -hmm. the strange thing about science and the strange thing about studies is that for every study that's positive there's a negative study mm -hmm. or whatever whatever one theory is there's another theory to counteract that I really you know in terms of when I'm working with say instructors or practitioners we really want to get them to experience it you know the whole the questioning, you know, and I've seen some people that they question things so much mm -hmm. that if you're questioning it, what level are you questioning it at? Yeah. It's purely theoretical debate that's going on in your mind because you might never get an answer to that. You know, we really have to say like breathing, just coming back to the basics here, breathing through the nose. People might say, well, there's no longitudinal studies and there's no validated science about that. Well, mm -hmm. you have to ask is, is it common sense? Yeah. How, how long have we been doing it for? You know, so I think the questioning, because we, like, one thing I suppose that has been very frustrating is that why hasn't nasal breathing got attention more? Oh, it's now getting attention. Um, but it should be getting a huge amount of attention mm -hmm. with children developing, with dentists, with orthodontists, with sleep doctors, you know, it should yeah. be getting a huge amount. You, you can't have a good night's sleep if your mouth breathes. If the child has the mouth open, their, their development is not as good as it should be. And this stuff has been written about. Like, I've seen Dental Cosmic, you know, it's, it's kind of a journal that was in yeah. the field of dentistry back in 1909. Yeah. And they were talking about the effects, the negative effects of mouth breathing, the, oh my God. the high palate, the narrow jaws, the malocclusions. This is not new stuff. You know there's so much information out there. Debate is going on and the debate is going on because people are often questioning too much. And yeah. instead we have to say, is it common sense? 
Is there any side effects? First, do no harm. And with breathing through the nose, it is yeah. like doing no harm. Yeah. So, so yeah, one of the, the elements that I often think about is, is the status quo what it is? And why yes. is it that way? Yes. So when it comes to um, medical doctors, uh, practitioners, a lot of times it is the fact that they don't want to think about the other thing because they're comfortable with the income. They're comfortable with yes. what is going on. Yes. Um, but yes, first do no harm. The number yeah. one thing that should should be pushed for a lot more than it is. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah, totally. Totally. Um, I understand the need for clinical trials when one is taking pharma, pharma, pharmaceutical intervention yeah. um, because the risk there could be very high, you know, and like it's it's sometimes kind of bizarre as well that the people who do stand up off the over the par put their head over the parapet are the, mm-hmm. are the ones that get shot at you know and literally not literally but yeah. you know kind of metaphorically um so yeah no questioning is good and putting it out there um is is important and I think that's the only way we're going to make progress yeah it's I mean the medical community is very int- it's become a religion versus yes. a uh, I mean, it was founded to prove common sense things and to, we started with breathing. We didn't start with science and then we went to breathing or then we went to science. And I think that's like, again, people don't realize in this case we were doing before we were trying to learn about why we were doing same with geometry. People are always like geometry is what allowed buildings to be created. It's like, no, people were building buildings. We wanted to figure out how geometry worked. So we started to identify oh, these angles look correct. Okay, this is the science behind what is going on. Yes, 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 yeah. yeah. I think that's, that's one, of the, one of the most crucial things that um, we often neglect is sometimes people do things right. Your grandma might actually have some good information. <laughs> yeah, totally, of course. They, our ancestors knew it. Exactly. They were doing a lot of good things right. Yeah. So I do normally like to ask, is there anything that you're obsessed with lately? But you did give me that lip tape. And the pulse oximeter, is there anything else like um, coffee or something amazing that's seasonal that you can only get in Ireland that, you're, that you love uh, at this point in time? Nothing that jumps out at me. Um, no, there's nothing that's just jumping out at me. You know, it's, it's what's my obsession at the moment. I suppose my obsession is just is continuing in the work. Yeah. I, it, it occupies a lot of my time. You know, it takes up. So, and I, I, like, I think it's really good now that there's, it's starting to, to make a difference. Yeah. You know, the last, I started off in 2002, from 2002 until 2012. Yes, we were noticing it. We were getting the information out there. 13 has increased, 14 has increased, but certainly the last three years, uh, it's just a different tra- trajectory. It's really yeah. changed. I think watch this space and not sure where it's when, how long it will take to get into mainstream. I think really people are starting to realize that, you know, it could be back to basics and yeah. maybe that might happen with information technology and with the likes of the phone and things like that, that people will do full circle and they'll come back to where, or at least they'll have a better awareness than when, when they left off. So yeah, nothing obsessive at the moment, just continuing doing what I'm doing and enjoying it. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I think the message really got to get out there with meditation becoming big, other breathing practices starting to really take hold. And this is the fundamental of health. Yes, absolutely. So if you don't know how to breathe, you can't get oxygen to your brain and your blood vessels and everything goes wrong. It is, but it's, it's understanding how can you breathe to open up the blood vessels activate the relaxation response and also enhance oxygen delivery to the cells. The phenomenal work of Dr. Buteco. Yeah. That's what he discovered, you know, um, and the applications are tr- tremendous. Like but becoming in with anxiety, panic, stress. That's one group. Asthma is another group and um, children with mouth breathing. And then we have our sports performance through the oxygen advantage. Yeah, and that's if you were to add up, that's a huge segment of the population. Even you spoke about hay fever, thirty percent of the Western population of hay fever. If you've got hay fever, you're twice as likely to have sleep problems. So people with hay fever are more likely to be tired. 
Mm. And people with asthma are more likely to have a stuffy nose and then their sleep is affected. So they're tired as well. So there's interconnections there. Yeah. You know, the nose is not just the two holes in the face and having a stuffy nose just doesn't affect the nose. It has a knock on effect. Probably sleep is the big one. But then mood is affected because your nose is designed to slow down your breathing. And if mm-hmm. you breathe slowly, you're calmer. Yeah. Whereas if you breathe through the mat, you breathe fast. And if you breathe fast, you're more agitated. Totally. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> luckily I was born with asthma, a bad orthodontist, and I get hay fever. So I'm very but that's all interconnected. All I didn't know you had asthma, but it's common that, you know, all three or four things can come together. And it's the breathing pattern disorders that's contributing to each and every one of them. Man, this is So most people with asthma, invariably, they naturally breathe through an open mouth. They shouldn't ever breathe through their their mouth. You know, there's no way you can protect your lungs by by mouth breathing. On a hot day, you, you, you protect your skin. You put on suntan lotion. You put on clothes. The, the area of contact of your skin to the atmosphere is two meters squared. But yet every breath that you take into your body is taken from the atmosphere direct into the body, into the lungs. Yeah. And if you were to open up the area of contact between the small air sacs and the atmospheric air, it's between 50 to 100 square meters. So we protect our, our skin, which is two square meters, but we don't protect our lungs. The only way to protect the lungs is to breathe in and out through the nose. Wow. Well, this was fascinating. I want to thank you a lot. Where can people find you um, just to really get the word sure. out there? Um, we've got lots of books. There's so many videos up on YouTube. We've different channels. One is butecoclinic.com, and that's for health. And then for sports performance, it's Oxygen Advantage. Awesome. So between the books and the videos and the information out there, I think there's a, there's a huge amount of resources that can, people can be starting themselves and practicing it. Awesome. Well, the oxygen advantage has really helped me. I'm going to definitely get that mouth tape and start using yes. that daily. Um, but besides that, I want to just thank you a lot for coming on the show. And um, we'll definitely, I will keep you updated on how the asthma and hay fever and everything Excellent. Uh, works together. Plenty of practice. <laughs> and uh, once you put into practice, I guarantee you, you'll get the results. Awesome. Well, thank you again. No problem. Take care, Austin. Bye. Bye-bye.